Korea's music and movies have been creating a sensation across the globe, and expectations are high for yet another year of stellar shows in 2023. So what idol groups are looking to make their debuts this year? What Korean productions are looking to hit the big screens this year? And how is Korea's entertainment industry using its fan base to champion social causes? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we touch upon the Korean productions to hit the music and movie screens this year, as well as related news. Now for more, I have Bernie Joe at DFSB Collective live on the line. Mr. Joe, it's good to have you with us. Good to be back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. I also have Pierce Conran joining the session virtually as well. Pierce, welcome back. Happy New Year, Sonny. Thanks for having me back. Right, Mr. Joe, we'll start with you. Now, a number of new girl groups are expected to make their debuts this year, including YG Entertainment's Baby Monster. Do you see 2023 as yet another stellar year for girl groups here? Well, you know, we ended 2022 really uh it was it was it was femme fatale girl power um you know time magazine tapped blackpink as entertainer of the year when we looked at the spotify year-end charts over half of the top artists and or songs were from girl bands from female artists and it seems almost fitting that YG Entertainment on January 1st at the stroke of midnight uh, just released a teaser of their new highly anticipated girl band called Baby Monster. And right off the bat, they broke a new record. Um, just with the teaser alone, they were able to secure over 100,000 subscribers or they basically uh, were able to nab the YouTube silver play button milestone in just one hour and 48 minutes. And to really understand how impressive that feat is, uh, the previous record holder, which was the boy band Ed Hyphen, it took them five hours and 56 minutes to hit that milestone and mark. Now, obviously, in addition to Baby Monster being one of the most hype bands that people are, are waiting to see, we can't forget that there were a lot of new girl bands who made names for themselves, uh, as you mentioned, whether it be like New Jeans, La Seraphim, and we can't forget Espa. Um, they're going to be coming up with follow-up uh, songs, videos, and albums. But um, there were some surprises from 2022 that are going to build on their momentum. Uh, two that come to mind uh, were uh, Stacy from High Up Entertainment and Ive from Starship Entertainment. Credit where credit's due, um, the fan site kpopmap.com. They actually went through the effort and were able to calculate that of the 41 confirmed new K-pop groups that are going to come out in 2023, uh, 23 of them are going to be girl bands. And I, obviously, I can't name them all because we wouldn't have enough time uh, because I would love to hear from Pierce. But what the three trends that I noticed among all the new girl bands that are going to debut in 2023 is in some cases there are more members. In other cases, they're more non-Korean members. Um, and in this case, we're going to see many firsts where we're going to see K-pop girl members from Turkey. Again, we're going to see more women coming from Thailand. And now we're even seeing K-pop members from Burma, from Russia, and even from Germany as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see K-pop not only go more global, but the look and feel is going to look more global as well. Right. It sounds impressive. Uh, meanwhile, Pierce, on screens nationwide as we speak is the movie Hero, which also stars 81-year-old Nam Moon Hee. Could you tell us a bit about this veteran actress and also a bit about the movie itself, Hero, which I understand has been garnering quite a bit of rave reviews here? Uh, sure. Well, um, um, Nam Moon Hee is really one of, kind of Korea's uh, acting treasures. She's been around for a very long time. Um, she uh, started in, in, in TV in the 70s, has been a, a big name since then. She only started in films in the late uh, 1990s in a uh, kind of a, a classic a black comedy called uh, the, the Quiet Family, the first film, incidentally, of director Kim Joon. Um, and uh, she has, uh, over the years, has been, you know, just kind of plays these kind of beloved uh, grandmother um, figures uh, in films such as um, I Can Speak, for which she kind of swept all the awards during the Korean awards season, at the, the Grand Bell Awards, the Blue Dragon Awards, the Bexang Awards, um, and films like Miss Granny as well. Uh, now, this new film, Hero, um, is... Um, it's her third collaboration with the director, uh, Yoon jae Gyun, who made the films Ode to My Father uh, and Haeundae, two of the biggest films of all time in Korea. The previous films she was in were Harmony and Pawn, which he produced. Um, this is um, the 
it's the adaptation of the stage musical uh, hero um, of the same name. It play it it stars the same actor Jung Sung Wah, who's been playing the role on stage for 13 years. Uh, he plays um, uh, An Jung Geun, of course, a famous um, uh, Korean independence fighter during the Japanese colonial era um, in the early 20th century, and um, she, uh, she plays um, his uh, mother, the mother who kind of sort of encouraged him to sacrifice himself for his country, um, which is something that she has said that. Uh, she found it a bit difficult um, as, a, as a mother herself to kind of empathize with, with that, but um, she played the role, of course, very, very well. Uh, the film is doing, is, doing, is doing well in theaters, but it's been somewhat overshadowed by the success of Avatar, which has been, of course, a massive hit. Um, but um, it's, playing, it's, kind of, it's, it's sort of playing well, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll stay in theaters for a little while longer. Right. And, and talking about theatres, Pierce, despite high hopes for a rebound in ticket sales last year, the sales have failed to return to pre-pandemic levels. What are your prospects for this year, 2023, Pierce? Uh, it's a good question. And frankly, um, people in the industry have been pretty worried. Uh, we've had, um, uh, you know, it's quite a downturn, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, things, you know, when sh theatres shut down, uh, just business went down to almost nothing and we were hoping things would really rebound last year with kind of the you know so-called return to normalcy and it seemed like that was happening um in the spring of last year when the roundup came out that's the sequel to the outlaws it was a gigantic hit uh something like 12.6 million admissions making it one of the top five films of all time and we thought oh great we're we're, we're back in business and things will be okay now and suddenly they weren't um a lot of huge box, um, anticipated box office hits didn't really pan out. Um, most notoriously, Alienoid, one of the most expensive Korean films of all time, was a, was a, was a big, big bomb in summer, and that was very unexpected. Um, the films that did do well were invariably all sequels, and um, that's quite normal in, in Hollywood. It has been for decades, but it's never been the case in, in the Korean market. Um, sequels were rare for a long time. They're more common now, but it's a little disturbing that the only films that did well were sequels. So we had uh, um, the sequel to Confidential Assignment. Confidential Assignment 2 was the big film for the Chuseok holidays. Um, there was uh, Hansan, which was the prequel to Roaring Currents, the biggest Korean film of all time. Um, there were a couple of other films like that. The, the Witch Part 2 was another one. Um, but um, other films, you know, original films, which Korean the Korean industry is known for it, it's kind of struggled quite badly. Even ones that were very well received, Park Chan-wook's new film, Decision to Leave, did, did, did okay, and it stuck around for a really long time, and everyone loved it, but it wasn't you know, a big box office set. Same for Life is Beautiful, a beloved musical that came out a few months ago. Audiences raved about it, and, and it played for a very, very long time, but at really, really low figures. Um, so it's a little concerning. You know, why is that happening? Uh, still effects of the of, of the pandemic sure um i think uh, and also you know the the, the popularity of streaming has been a big um, impact but i think the biggest one has been the actual cost of the tickets um they increased three times over the course of a year during the pandemic effectively increasing 30 percent and so people suddenly feel that the cinema is not a cheap um pastime anymore and just, well, that's why things that are kind of uh, seen as, uh, as a sure thing, a sequel or a Marvel film or Avatar, um, are really the only things that people are, are willing to go watch now. We'll see what happens, but it's a little, little uncertain now. Right, I see the price factor. Mr. Joe, back in the K-pop industry, despite BTS's temporary break amid the group's military obligations, its members' solo activities have been quite dynamic, if I may say so. Now, one of the latest involves Chi Min's collaboration with Big Bang's Taeyang. Do tell us more about this endeavor. And generally speaking, what are the broader implications, Mr. Joe, of such joint projects among artists from different labels? Well, you know, for me, I'm always a big fan of collaborations, but, you know, historically, traditionally in K-pop, if collaborations were to happen, uh, it was often amongst uh, label mates. And so, you know, it felt like, okay, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a family affair. But we're starting to see more and more artists, be it groups, be it solo, or for that matter, solo efforts from groups. Uh, where they're reaching out beyond the borders and beyond the boundaries of their labels to basically collaborate with artists that they love, they like, and more importantly, respect. And what I find fascinating, interesting, and, and frankly, I'm a fan of, is that when BTS does do some sort of collaboration, or for that matter, maybe even a cover song, 
there's usually kind of a not so subtle nod, a tip of the hat, or for that matter, I think really a tribute to predecessors. Um, I remember in 2017, uh, BTS not only covered the Sotheji classic Come Back Home, but it was almost a frame for frame remake of the original video. And I thought that was amazing that they paid tribute to one of the pioneers. Uh, last year, Psy teamed up with BTS and Suga for That That. And again, it's interesting that BTS, although they are the biggest popping in the world right now, paying tribute to Psy on his comeback effort, I thought was really refreshing and incredibly nice. And with BTS Jimin teaming up with Taeyang, I also see a bit of a tribute here um, because Taeyang, and we got to remember, you know, with history, um, he was actually the first K-pop artist to ever hit number one on the Apple iTunes R&B Soul album chart way back in 2010. He was the first ever to go number one in North America, even before Psy. And so I find it a bit of a nice kind of full circle that BTS, Jimin, and Taeyang are teaming up to drop a new single called Appropriately Enough Vibe and be on the lookout for it worldwide on all platforms and all streaming services um, and probably, you know, CDs and, and whatnot on uh, January 13th. Uh, but everyone's talking about it. And I'm sure it's going to be a huge hit for not just Taeyang, not just Jimin, but for both artists and more importantly for both fan and fan bases. Right, and I will make a note of that on my calendar as well. Pierce, also on the subject of uh, joint projects, Korean director Park chan decision to leave stars Chinese actress uh, Tang Wei, and it's been shortlisted for the Golden Globe, which I believe we covered a while back. What do you believe are the prospects of a win there? Uh, uh, this is something I'm... I'm you, keenly focus on. I'm really um, um, uh, curious to see how it's going to do during this kind of award season in America. Decision to leave is, you know, it, from my mind, in my mind at least, a masterpiece. It was my favorite Korean film uh, last year. I uh, debuted at the Cannes Film Festival, won the Best Director Award, um, and it has garnered, you know, fantastic reviews both in Korea and America and around the world. Um, it's it's kind of tricky, though. Um, it's uh, it's going up against some other films that are that are looking pretty good as well. So it's nominated for the Best Foreign Film um, Award at the Golden Globes, and it's is one of the favorites, but I think the actual favorite now is the Indian film RRR by director S.S. Rajamuli, which um, has really kind of um, been um, mounting a very impressive awards campaign. Um, uh, a lot of very kind of, you know, exciting screenings and kind of voters of these kind of groups are going and being invited and having a really good time. So I think that RRR is looking like the favorite at the moment. There's also the um, Netflix World War I film, uh, All Quiet in the Western Front, which is looking pretty strong as well. However, looking forward to the Oscars um, in a few months, uh, you have um, uh, actually RRR is, will not be eligible for, for that prize because it was not selected by India as their official pick. However, it will be eligible for other prizes, but not for the best international film prize. So there, I think it actually has a better chance of winning the Oscar than it does of winning the Golden Globes. And the question also is, you know, how could it do um, during in other awards for the Oscars? You know, I mean, Parasite a few years ago, you know, showed that a Korean film can go pretty far. So the main categories that it's aiming for would be best director for Park chan and also best screenplay, co-written by Park chan and Jung so Young, who also did Little Women last year, big year for her. Um, so uh, is it is is it likely to be nominated for for either of those? I'm not sure. It's one of the contenders for sure, but the, there are a few other films that are looking almost certain to be nominated now. So it's it's one of the films that is kind of vying for that kind of fifth place in both of those categories. So fingers crossed, and a lot could happen next few weeks, but it's going to be a tough road ahead. Right, I see. And Mr. Joe, just as movies have movie theaters to showcase their productions, I understand K-pop industry insiders have long been calling for the establishment of K-pop concert only venues to perhaps better cater to its large fan base. Now, I understand Seoul is looking to answer these calls. Could you tell us a bit more? Yes. Um, you know, even before COVID hit, uh, there was definitely a concern in the music industry in terms of um, concert venues. Uh, basically, there was a gap because there were either huge venues that were never even meant for music to begin with. They were essentially sports arenas and sports, uh, sports stadiums, which had to, you know, to be, to, uh, to put it politely, uh, horrible acoustics, or the clubs were too small. So there was always this huge gap for medium-sized venues, but more importantly, um, venues that were actually specially built to handle music. Now, these arenas, these new arenas were scheduled to be built anyways between 2019, 2021, 
COVID happened to hit and it ended up canceling a lot of concerts, but many people in the industry were concerned about when these venues are under construction, uh, how would they be able to absorb this growing demand for live shows? Now that COVID is tapering off and live shows are starting to come back, fortunately, some of these new venues are starting to open. Um, right out near the Incheon Airport, there'll be a new Inspire um, uh, arena that's going to be opening up that'll house 15,000 plus fans. Uh, CJ Live City is currently under construction, teamed up with AEG, and they're slated to be uh, going live uh, in the Goyang area in the next, uh, you know, within the next two years. And then also um, the city of Seoul and Kakao also have another massive Seoul arena being built that's uh, supposedly being able to handle 18,000. Now, these venues are not specifically meant just for Korean fans within Korea who happen to love K-pop. One of the great things about K-pop is it is a tremendous magnet for tourists, for tourism. Whenever the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, and it's no coincidence, those three are linked together, um, time and time again, um, fans of Hallyu, when they ask why they want to come to Korea, music is usually one of the top reasons and one of the many things they do when they come to Korea is music related um, visiting sites to going to events. And so in many ways, these arenas will not only satisfy local fans, I think it will be a huge, massive magnet for more tourists who also happen to be K-pop fans. And to put that into context, uh, at one point, a survey was done by the Ministry of Culture showing that one out of 13 tourists that came to Korea came because of BTS. And so the power of K-pop with these live venues and tourism, I think, is just going to be a plus, plus, plus across the board. Right. And staying with support efforts, Pierce, I hear the Cheonju International Film Festival this year will seek to support Korean indie films on global screens. Could you tell us a bit more about this initiative and perhaps its uh, importance? Uh, sure. So the Jeonju International Film Festival is one of the three main uh, film events in Korea, along with the Busan Film Festival, the biggest one, and the Bucheon Fantastic Film Festival. Uh, it's, it's geared mostly towards art house films, um, and it has been supporting art house films, uh, you know, for over for over 20 years. And they've had several very successful programs, including the uh, digital, uh, the Jeonju Digital Project, which was kind of an omnibus project where they invited three filmmakers to do uh, these kind of uh, digital video films and kind of put it together in a portmanteau film. Uh, more recently, they started the John Drew Cinema Projects, which was an expansion where they funded uh, filmmakers to make entire movies that would premiere at John Drew and go and then screen at global festivals around the world. Um, and there have been some, some great films there. Um, and now this new thing they're doing is called John Drew Project. And what that is, it's going to be a work in progress section, which means that filmmakers who have films that are kind of not not complete, um, but uh, kind of almost ready to go, will be um, screened at the festival to um, kind of in kind of in, in behind the closed doors events for industry figures. It could be um, uh, representatives from foreign film festivals or distribution companies or production companies, etc. That might give some some advice for their distribution strategies or maybe post-production strategies to make the films the best they can be and um, uh, most most uh, likely to kind of uh, secure invitations and distribution to international events and territories. Um, John Joe has been just very successful for this for, for a very long time, and this is just an, a new prong that kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of widens the net for what they're doing, and uh, so it's another exciting development for them. Right. And Ms. Stiger, also the subject of initiatives, SM Entertainment is spearheading a green campaign. In fact, on the 1st of January this year, it hosted a sustainability forum online where its founder highlighted the importance of planting trees. Now, I hear that, I, I believe that is, that there's been a shift over the years, if I may, Mr. Joe, in how K pop insiders are using their fan base to champion social causes. Do you agree? And if so, if so what do you suppose is behind this trend? I would actually slightly disagree. I don't think this noise and this um, buzz is actually coming from K-pop insiders openly using their fan base. I actually think it's coming from the fans themselves. Um, if we look at the K-pop industry, it has been one of the fastest growing music markets in the world. But then when we take into consideration exports, uh, Korea has just been constantly increasing almost really exponentially when it comes to their exports. And one of the things driving K-pop sales worldwide is physical music, physical albums, but namely CDs. 
And everybody knows how bad CDs are for the environment, whether it's the packaging, the plastic, the papers, the inks used. And the fact is, is that Korea right now is the third largest physical music market in the world. Again, powered mostly by CDs. Some of the best selling artists worldwide, top 20 artists um, are there, because, are K-pop artists and they're there because of CDs. Now it turns out that the K-pop fans, um, when they look to some of their favorite K-pop artists who are embracing environmental causes, they in turn have been pushing and really been making a lot of noise about K-pop CDs and its impact on the environment. And as a result, in response to the fans' feedback, um, many of the top K-pop music companies have been looking for ways and means to become more eco-friendly, more green in their approach on selling physical music to their fans. So over the past uh, few months and, and really over the past few years, we've seen more K-pop music companies look at you know, using more eco-friendly inks to packaging, to paper, to maybe not even using plastic and putting out physical music goods. And so it comes really as no surprise that Chairman Lee, who's always been a pioneer in the industry to go even further, to go out and say, we need to even go more green, um, is really a testament to sort of where the industry's headed towards. And then we also can't forget that not one, not two, but pretty much all the top K-pop music companies are publicly traded on COSDAQ, the Korean Stock Exchange. And one of the biggest things investors are now asking for and really demanding is what we call ESG. ESG is not the name of a new boy band, although it would sound good. ESG stands for Environmental, uh, Social, and Governance. And as a result, more corporations are being asked to think of more ways and means to be positive uh, in their approach to business, especially when it comes to the environment. So I think it's both um, fan-driven and also financial um, incentivized uh, movement uh, towards going more green. And I think in the end, it's, it's going to be good for everybody. Right. And beyond the environment, Pierce, how do you respond to efforts by those in the entertainment industry to champion social matters like BTS last year heading off to the White House to denounce anti-Asian violence and so forth? Uh, well, first of all, regarding the environmental issues, Bernie, you really put me on the spot. I have a wall of physical media behind me. Here. <laughs> but, uh, um, yes, for the, the the as far as the film industry is concerned, um, it's true. It's it's very much been um, uh, supportive of, of social causes. You know, kind of since 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 forever, really, because. Um, I think if you look at, if you consider any kind of major Korean film, there's there's almost always, you know, a, a, a social element to it. The ones that have done well globally, particularly, I mean, look at, you know, Parasite, it's about social inequality, Squid Game as well. Um, last year's big hit TV show, Extraordinary Attorney Wu, uh, zombie success films, are Train to Busan, these are all about social issues. And the um, we spoke about uh, Jeonju as well, and pretty much every Korean film that will premiere at Jeonju has a very strong social message to convey and uh looking at, at figures in the industry you have a lot of people who have who who support social causes one person that comes to mind who's been extremely vocal is actor Chong Song, um who is frequently um uh you know in in the headlines for for kind of the uh, criticizing um various issues uh, like the uh how how korea has dealt with uh with the with refugees coming in the country he's been very supportive of refugees, he's he's even he's part of the um, he's an ambassador for the United Nations, the High Commission for Refugees. He's visited many countries to to um, uh, discuss these problems. Uh, so there are a lot of people in the industry that that are supporting social causes, um, and that kind of always has been um, a big a big point in 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 the industry's favor. I think. Right, I see. All right, as always, Chris, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Mr. Joe, over in the U.S., thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this week's editions of Issues and Insiders. Have a great weekend. See you same time next Monday.